Welcome back. Twitter and Facebook followers, uh, we're here in the Arthritis Broadcast Network studios at the uh, 2020 CRA AHPA scientific meeting here being held in Victoria, British Columbia. And uh, we've been fortunate to be able to get people who are actually here at the conference, presenters at the conference to come in and to the studio so that we could actually ask them and talk to them about what they're doing so that you uh, in on both Facebook and Twitter uh, can learn what it is that we're actually here for. And uh, try and remember also that uh, you can send in questions uh, through that system and we'll uh, present those questions to our, our, our guest uh, uh, at near the end of the interview. So it's uh, just a little, I'm Don Binden from the Canadian Spondylitis Association and uh, I'm your host for today. Uh, one of the things I want to just say is to a great welcome to Darren Karaja Bailey. Uh, he's here as a researcher uh, that's working on a, a project and in fact has worked on uh, projects before this. So we're going to touch base about some of his, the work that he did uh, 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 prior to what he's here for this time and really what it is that you're here as well. So really welcome Darren, thank you for coming. Thank you. So um, you've done research work in um, the arthritis side for uh, um, a couple of different things that here. You did one on, on exercise earlier on at one time, I understand. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah, when I was a when I was a medical student, I had, I had a kinesiology background before yes. uh, medical school, and um, one of my interests uh, was exercise and the role of exercise both mm -hmm. for prevention but also for management of chronic diseases. And um, I ended up shadowing uh, Dr. Shajanya, Cam Shajanya, yes. out in uh, out in Vancouver when I was a second year medical student. And one of the things that he mentioned was um, kind of what he does to prescribe exercise to his patients and the ways that he's able to streamline that. Uh, kind of at the same time, I was working with an initiative called Exercises Medicine Canada, and I was setting up a local chapter at UBC called I guess, Exercises Medicine at UBC. And I was working with a, a physiatry resident at the time, her name was Dr. Kyla Holtz, and, and she was developing this, this resource online, this web-based resource to facilitate exercise prescription by healthcare providers. So then after shadowing Dr. Shajanya, after being involved with Exercises Medicine Canada and uh, working with Dr. Holtz, the three of us came together and tried to, I guess, develop this resource to facilitate exercise prescription by healthcare professionals. And in the end, after that, we published a short report um, in the Canadian Rheumatology Association Journal to, to outline what we had. And it's open access, it's free, and the idea is just to, it adds maybe a three to five minutes to an encounter at the end that right. connects patients with resources to become more physically active whether that just means being more active day to day or starting a structured exercise program. Well, I read the report actually, and I, uh, the reason why it was of interest to me is because um, I have ankylosing spondylitis, and of course, and exercise programs are, are important for all people with with uh, any form of arthritis. Mm -hmm. But uh, the one that I noted about my own disease was is that it, it has some specific exercises that, that that are actually geared towards it. So the idea that you could just suddenly say, "Well, I've been running; I'm a runner, so therefore, my exercises that I run uh, is is fine for your general health." Right. Uh, but uh, when it comes down to specific diseases related to arthritis, sometimes you need some exercises very that are very prescribed for what you have to. So was your finding was that your findings that when you were doing the study at that time? So so this was actually not we haven't actually evaluated the resources oh, yeah, yet. yet. Um, those are going to be kind of the next steps of the project. But I think one of the key focuses along the same lines of that uh, was to ensure that when we were, when we were making any recommendations, making those recommendations, okay. acknowledging that uh, there are different. Uh, different limitations for different individuals and different exercises will fit better with different individuals and, and recognizing that often taking a graduate or stepwise approach um, to increase its kind of daily activity sometimes is a great start um, and also connecting individuals with exercise physiologists or experts who can then better cater physical activity to their needs. So we haven't actually uh, evaluated this resource oh, yeah. yet, um, but I think that would be an excellent question to address in the future. I think you, uh, it went really well. Oh, well awesome, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's uh, actually, uh, uh, it's interesting at this scientific meeting, I've yeah. noticed at the scientific meeting that um, wellness is actually on the agenda here in many cases. And so I, I really thought that a scientific meeting that I wouldn't understand very many of the words that are being spoken and, f and occasionally I am, have been noticing that some people can get quite scientific. Yeah. But for the most part, a lot of the material that's being done here are things like diets, exercising, those kind of wellness circumstances uh, that uh, they're looking at, they're saying, this is a areas that uh, that our patients really need. Yeah. No, I think that's fantastic. I think that's one of the most exciting things about the conference for me. I mean, I'm only a first year internal medicine resident who's interested in rheumatology, so I'm 
I'm very far back in my training process, but one of the things that attracts me to rheumatology is the fact that there's there's such a great opportunity for non-pharmacologic prevention, non-pharmacologic intervention. So, my my particular interests are in you know physical activity, mindfulness and meditation, uh, and also nutrition. And so these are areas that I, I hope to pursue further through research. Um, and I guess the projects that I've, I'm presenting here are just kind of a an introduction to that, but that's kind of where I want to go with my career in the future. Well, you have a current pro a project, so yeah. you have a poster actually. Mm -hmm. here. I understand you're showing your poster tomorrow. That's and right. Yeah, they're yeah. setting them all up right now, and um, I just have to say that in when I first uh, got involved in arthritis, I when I looked at the posters, I said. Why is graphic artistry supposed to be part of what we're doing until I actually saw one? <laughs> and, uh, they're, they're a lot more in-depth than that, and they're a lot more informative than that, then, too. So I'm, um, uh, I hope that yours goes well. <laughs> Thank you. I hope but it's, so but it's the, um, the content, I think, which is uh, more important. So uh, this particular one is, uh, uh, is actually dealing with healthcare professionals themselves. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So when I was a fourth-year medical student, I did a rotation um, in rheumatology at Vancouver General Hospital. and. One of the noon rounds presentations uh, were on, I guess, new developments in, in research in rheumatoid arthritis, and one of the topics was on obesity. And and the conclusion of this talk, one of the many conclusions, was that um, obesity individuals who who have obesity or who who are overweight, they have a poor responsiveness to biologic therapy, uh, and also often experience more severe or active rheumatoid arthritis. And so, knowing this and having my own preconceived notions and biases about the education we receive through medical school residency. I wanted to see if rheumatologists felt comfortable managing obesity, for example, clinically, because it's not an area that we necessarily get a lot of training in. Um, further, when I dived a bit deeper, when I dove a bit deeper into the literature, uh, I realized that the same patterns exist with smoking. So once again, cigarette smoking, tobacco use are associated with more severe uh, disease activity and also maybe poor responsiveness to biologic therapy. And so what I wanted to do was survey rheumatologists, um, first in British Columbia, uh, rheumatologists and rheumatology nurses, because rheumatology nurses are often heavily involved in these discussions, um, across British Columbia and then across Canada, um, and, and see what their knowledge was of the impact of obesity or smoking on RA, see what their beliefs were about these topics, like the relative importance of these topics, um, see their, their sense of confidence when actually dealing with these things clinically day to day, and lastly, to, to discover if there were any recurrent barriers that we could address as a research team to try and facilitate the management of obesity uh, and, and tobacco use with patients who have rheumatoid arthritis to optimize their outcomes long term. Even the prejudices that might come from the way that they view someone and, and, and whether or not some of, they're creating some of their own problems in, in, in their disease and therefore maybe looking at them differently than they, than they might in another, in another setting? Yeah, so I think that's, that's one of the big challenges with, with, um, with weight management and also with smoking. I think there is tremendous stigma, especially around weight. Yep. Uh, and I think one of the most important things when it comes to, to weight management is just to encourage um, healthy weights yes. and also to, encourage, uh, to, to outline to patients that you know, a clinically significant weight loss is often 5% and, and it's, there's not like a nest, like, I mean, when we talk about the normal BMI oh, yeah. and, and whatnot, I mean, these are often like normal distributions and people can be healthy at, at different weights. Um, obviously, there are extremes to this, but people can be healthy at various weights and acknowledging that and realizing that these discussions um, should only be initiated if the patient is open and willing and it should be done in a non-judgmental manner. So really what we wanted to do is try and see if we could even uncover some of these implicit biases, although that wasn't the purpose of the project, but if we can essentially move towards helping rheumatologists and rheumatology nurses open up these discussions in non-judgmental, non-threatening ways, and then connecting these patients who are interested in either um, achieving a healthy weight or uh, reducing their tobacco use, uh, and connecting those people to uh, individuals who have expertise in motivational interviewing or behavioral goal setting um, so that this is done in a way that doesn't affect um, their own sense of self or uh, there's no personal attacks, you know what I mean? Is there, uh, is there anywhere in the curriculum right now that actually addresses those issues or is that a gap that exists within the medical training that everyone's receiving. So I think that I think that things are getting better. But I would say that interestingly, in, in our study, um, I only presented the data from British Columbia at, at this uh, at this conference. But we do have more of the Canadian data, and 
the trends that nearly every participant said that the, the training they received through medical, nursing school, or residency was poor or fair when it came to okay. uh, obesity or weight management and, and tobacco use or smoking cessation. So the consensus is that the education that we receive um, could be better. Uh, I think that, like I said, things are getting better. For example, um, in our medical school at UBC, there is, you know, there is a session, there's a couple of sessions on um, introductions to motivational interviewing, on smoking cessation. Um, with the new spiral curriculum at UBC, there's a repetitive focus on preventative medicine, primary, secondary prevention. Um, but I think there's tremendous room for improvement. And mm -hmm. so that's where I hope to, to go with this long term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One question I have is that uh, you've done one study on exercise, the other one on, what's next for you? What's next for me? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think one area that I hope to, to study further, I don't have necessarily an idea for this yet, or a study design, um, but I think one, of the, one thing I want to do is mirror the current study that we've done in rheumatologists and, 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 and do that same study uh, in a subset of patients to see what the patient's experiences are with um, with the management of their weight or their cigarette use, or sorry, their, yeah, their tobacco use. So one, one thing I want to do is pretty much the same study, but uh, surveying the patients and seeing if there's any discrepancies between those two. Um, but the other thing I want to study a bit more is, is like the role of, of brief mindfulness or meditation intervention and see how that may impact, uh, for example, chronic pain perception in patients with inflammatory arthritis, or see if mindfulness, med like short mindfulness meditation interventions can, um, once again, facilitate improved quality of life. But I don't have a specific study design yet. But I, I want to study mindfulness and meditation in, a, in inflammatory arthritis a little bit more. How about uh, from a, a, a final medical career direction? What are you looking for for you there? Uh, so I hope to, I mean, I'm only, a, I said I'm only a first year resident right now at UBC, but I'm hoping I'm only a first year resident, that's, that's four ways down the road. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah, I've done quite a bit of education at this point, yeah, that's true. Uh, but I'm hoping to uh, master to rheumatology somewhere in Canada, uh, fellowship hopefully, uh, and then after that, uh, I would really like to have an academic practice where I'm able to continue to pursue some of these research interests. Mm -hmm. And I know this sounds like a lot, but I also hope to maintain a small fraction of general internal medicine practice because I do truly enjoy practicing general medicine. And I think mm -hmm. if I went into rheumatology, one of the aspects I really like about rheumatology is the, the multi-system involvement. And I think that to keep my skills sharp, it would be nice to do a little bit of community general internal medicine along with a fraction of academic research and then obviously doing clinical rheumatology. So those kind of three three areas I want to pursue. Well, uh, from, a, from just from a personal perspective and, and um, is that we could use some more rheumatologists. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, we'd be, uh, we were just talking, I was talking a little while ago about the idea that um, most of our rheumatologists or a number of our rheumatologists are reaching retirement age. Okay. And yeah. we are, in fact, retiring them. And so the number of new ones that we're producing, I remember when you were hearing that they said, it's been a great year, we've got four new ones, you know, coming out of British Columbia. And he was, I think, these kind of numbers. <laughs> Boy, I'm, I'm wondering if the factory is actually moving in the, you know, fast enough in those directions. So, so I'm glad you're interested in doing that yeah. as well as the other, the other kind of work that's here. Of course. But the, so how did you end up, when you were just heading towards medical school, how, mm -hmm. did, how, did, you, how did you actually develop, delve off into one side or another? What, what motivated you during medical school to say, you know what, I really like this stuff? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that, so my story was a bit of uh, a bit atypical, I guess. So I, I did, as I said, I did kinesiology beforehand. Okay. So I think I had some bias towards the musculoskeletal system. Uh, that said, going into my clinical years, third and fourth year, I thought I wanted to do emergency medicine because I enjoyed the structured approach to emergency medicine. To me, it seemed very practical, very rational. My dad's an engineer, and it seemed like it fit with my thinking process. Um, what I realized that after doing emergency medicine was that uh, I liked seeing the patients who were admitted to the ward, who were internal medicine patients, who were complex and who required a bit more time to sort out their relative issues. And okay. I liked following patients longitudinally and seeing them get better. And if they didn't get better, seeing ways to try and facilitate uh, improvements in their quality of life. And so I think longitudinal care kind of attracted me towards internal medicine. And then within internal medicine, after having uh, had some exposure to rheumatology and, and seeing um, and essentially seeing the the huge role for non-pharmacologic management, yes. as well as seeing the, the incredible developments that are taking place from a pharmacologic perspective, I just thought this was a field where I could pursue my interests in you know, physical activity, as I said, mindfulness, nutrition, but at the same time kind of take off with, 
with all these new pharmacologic developments that are taking place, with all the new biologics that are coming out, the improved side effect profiles, and the fact that patients are experiencing you know, greater quality of life with, with various new agents. So I think that there's incredible growth in rheumatology, and there's still an opportunity for me to pursue my other interests. So that's why I kind of gravitate towards rheumatology, and it'll be exciting to see where the field goes, but that's kind of what I'm hoping to, to do. This actually sounds like a great idea for a career. It, 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 it actually has some width to it, so that there's a, you know, some directions to go to. Mm -hmm. And it certainly sounds like it keeps somebody's interest while they drag you through <laughs> residency. Because uh, I seem to remember that the amount of time that residents spend standing on their feet is considerable <laughs> in most of these places. That is it's true. a good thing you're in good physical condition and you take good nutrition and you're mindful because <laughs> they, they, they really put you through the paces. Of yeah, the residents. Anita, has there been any questions that came from the field? Uh, yes, uh, because you're interested in the topic, we had a question that came in saying, can you define what mindfulness is? Oh, that's a tough question. Okay. Um, so I would say that's the way I think of mindfulness. Um, so I think of, it, it's such a degree of being present in, in, in any given moment. Um, and so I think there are a few analogies that are used. So personally, I use the Headspace app quite a bit, and I think I've learned a lot of, uh, a lot of mindfulness through that app. And so essentially when I, when I say being present, it just means focusing on the task at hand and doing so in a non-judgmental manner. So the key words I think are presenteeism and non-judgment, non I guess. Um, and so the analogy that's often used in the Headspace app is, is cars passing through traffic and you're an individual who's watching cars pass. And so if, um, if you try to control traffic, if you try and stop all the cars passing, you will have tremendous difficulty, it will cause stress, Whereas what you want to do is you want to sit back and observe the cars passing, not judge the cars for the speeds they're going at, and just see the cars passing. And really, this analogy is uh, it's drawing a parallel to your thoughts. So the cars in this scenario are thoughts, and you are a passive observer of your thoughts. You're not judging your thoughts, you're not judging your feelings, you're not judging any sensations you're having. Rather, you're observing them as they fluctuate over time. And you know if you can take that step back and observe it, you, I, I found that, at least in my life, things become a little bit easier and you become a little bit more patient and you don't become so invested in, in emotions and you're able to kind of more rationally understand them. I'm also not an expert in mindfulness, but this is just my understanding. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's actually a great quality to have in a physician. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because uh, certainly all of those qualities are necessary mm -hmm. when you're watching patients walk by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Over the course of a long time. Well, I want to thank you, Darren, for coming in. And, and I'm wishing you the best in your poster tomorrow. Oh, thank right? you. Uh, well, earlier on, we had uh, uh, Andrew Nakita here, and he won last year, by the way, just in Montreal. He had the best poster. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so he's the reigning champion. So okay. I, I'm hoping that you actually <laughs> join him in the ring so okay. this year for tomorrow. And uh, in particular, we want to we want to wish you very well in the in your continuing medical career. Okay. Well, thank and you. Thank you very much for coming in. Really appreciate it.